Good morning. This recording is for Sunday, September 6th, and uh, as we're getting ready to go into the high holy days of Israel, I want to blow the shofar and then we're going to pray. but I want to point out to you that the shofar, it, ha it has historic and spiritual significance. Uh, the shofar is man it's not man-made, it's God-made. In the Old Testament, they had silver trumpets and so on, but the shofar alone was created by God. This comes from the, the horns of an animal, a uh, ram's horn, and the sound, then because the, because the instrument is God-made, then the sound needs to take us to memory of our Creator. Whenever we hear the shofar, we think of Creator God, and we, we exalt Him for all His creation. We thank Him and praise Him. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we come to You today thanking You and praising You for the wonderful times that we have in Your Word. I pray, Holy Spirit, lead and guide in this, in this Bible study today, in this Word for Your people this message for a Sunday morning. And I pray, Lord, that your people are having worship and, and, and receiving these messages. And, and Lord, not only hearing your word, but then trusting and obeying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise God. We're going to go back to uh, where we introduced last week uh, the book of Nehemiah. But first of all, I want to read Second Chronicles 7.14 again. People, a lot of people are getting uh, confused, dismayed, upset, impatient, uh, angry, you name it. Uh, but, but, but the most important thing is not, is not this virus, this COVID that's hit our land and hit, all, hit the whole world. The most important thing is the spiritual condition of America right now. And so we go back to this this scripture, if my people, 7, 714, Second Chronicles, if my people, the church, God's people, who are called by my name, believers, Christians, will humble themselves, bow down, bow down, stop standing up stiff and, and fighting for your rights, bow down, and pray, and seek my face, seek the Lord, not man's ideas, not your own opinion, but seek the Lord and turn from their wicked ways, sin in the church. There's a lot of sin in the church. Then I will hear from heaven. The Lord promises if we will do the previous things, he then will do his part. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. There's no debate and no dispute over the need for, for America to be spiritually healed. And so we're gonna deal with that today, we go to the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> As we pointed out last week, uh, the most important thing is what's going on in our land spiritually. America, when it comes to our the, the spiritual and moral uh, fiber of America, America is, is like uh, Judah and, and J Jerusalem was when Nehemiah got this report. Uh, spiritually and morally the walls are broken down the gates are burned with fire and, uh, and it's it's an America is a is a broken nation a nation in pain so we see things that uh, are in terrible disarray in terrible condition we have riots in the street we have immorality uh, to 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 beyond the extent of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, beyond the sin and the violence of the times of Noah. Jesus said that in the last days the, the, the times would be similar to the times uh, before the flood. And we're seeing that. There's violence and people are killing people uh, just because of which uh, candidate they support. Uh, and killing people because of political opinions. Uh, this, is, this is insane. It's demonic and it's satanic. Uh, let's, let's, read, let's read Nehemiah again, uh, beginning with chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, 
It came to pass in the months of Shaviv, in the 20th year, I was in Shushan at the citadel, and Hananiah, one of my brethren, came from me from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah loved Judah. He loved his land. He loved the, the city of Jerusalem, the holy city. And, and he wanted to know, what, what is the condition of our homeland? Then he said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are, gone, are, are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. And so it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you, to you, you who love you and observe your commandments. So God shows mercy to those who love him and observe or keep his commandments. In verse 6, he says, please let your ear be attentive. See, this sounds familiar uh, in 2 Chronicles uh, 7, uh, uh, 15. God says, if we'll repent and so on, his, ear, his, his eyes will be upon us, his ear will be attentive to this place. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes upon uh, that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of your ch the children of Israel which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. See, Nehemiah is not standing before God and saying, you know, my whole nation is full of sinners but I'm, you know, above that. He's, he's confessing his own sin and the sins of his people. We have acted corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. <clears throat> Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. And that's that Hebrew word pada is used over and over again for the word redeemed. Now these are your servants, Nehemiah says, whom you have redeemed. In other words, you, they're, you, you redeemed them. You're not going to let them perish, are you, Lord? You, you're, by your great power and your strong hand, O oh Lord, he redeemed them where? He redeemed them uh, uh, out of Egypt from the hand of Pharaoh, from the, from the slavery there. He's redeemed them. He's, he's watched over them over and over again. He took them through the Red Sea. He fed them in the desert. He's redeemed them. Oh, Lord, I pray, let your ear be attentive to prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So Nehemiah is asking the Lord to use him and to give him mercy in the sight of the pagan king, the ungodly king. And we'll, we'll get into that, uh, Lord willing, later on. Nehemiah is crying out for his homeland, for Israel, for the holy city, Jerusalem, and also for the people of God, whom you have redeemed, whom you have pada, you have redeemed them. Uh, to release, pada means to release, to preserve, to rescue, to deliver, to liberate, to cut loose, sever free, to ransom. And he paid the price. He's paid the price. Think about us as we're praying for America. Cry out to God and say, Lord, uh, the, the, the land is full of your people whom you've redeemed. Yeah, there are many sinners and there are many of your people that are sinning, but these are the people you have redeemed. You paid the price. 
with your only blood, your precious, the blood of your precious son. He ransomed us, Pada. And then uh, let's, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy and uh, chapter, we're in chapter seven, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses six through nine. <clears throat> For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself a special tre treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Speaking to Israel, the Lord did not set his love on, on you nor choose you because you were more in number than the other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he will keep an oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you, Rapada from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's the Lord who loves his people, who keeps, he keeps covenant for a thousand generations. And then Psalm uh, 130 verses 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, pada, and with him is abundant redemption, pada, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He's going to pada or ransom Israel from all iniquities. God pledge, pledges to ransom his people even from the power of the grave. And we know that through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, God has ransomed us from death, hell, and the grave. Uh, Hosea 13 and 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. In other words, the Lord says, I'm going to deal with death. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. The Lord has no pity on death, hell, and the grave. Where does death, hell, and the grave come in? That was introduced by the fall of man, and Satan brought that upon mankind. In Isaiah 35 and 10, and the ransom of the Lord shall return, Pada, and come to Zion with singing, with, everla with everlasting joy on their head. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away from them. And then Isaiah 51 and 11 says the same thing. So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy in their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Whether ransom is brought by means of payment or by miraculous liberation, Pada speaks of, or ransom speaks of, God's desire to free his people. Now, we got to understand that because when we're praying, uh, uh, maybe there's bondage in your own personal life. When you're praying and talking to God, you need to know that it is his desire. It's God's desire to set his people free. It's God's, it's God's desire to set America free. If the church will stop fussing and get busy praying about what's really wrong in America, then God will hear and he'll answer prayer. Nehemiah gets this report of the condition of Jerusalem. The walls broken down. The, the wall that circles the city has been broken down. The gates are burned with fire and it breaks his heart. Nehemiah assumes this posture of prayer and intercession. He sat down. He couldn't stand. He fell down and he wept and he mourned for many days. He was fasting and praying for the God of heaven to bring redemption or pada to his people. Uh, a nation, a nation filled with God's people should never get into this condition. See, Israel departed from the Lord and God turned them over to their enemies. They, the, the city was uh, torn down. Uh, the, 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 the people of Israel, most were taken captive uh, and it was a sad situation. Think of America. America is, is considered by the whole world to be a Christian nation. A Christian nation should never 
ever get in the condition it's in right now. We need to cry out to the Lord. Pada, Lord Jesus, release America, preserve, rescue, deliver, liberate America. Cut us loose from sin. Ransom America by your precious blood. Mercy, not judgment, we cry. At this moment in America, we face the virus, riots in our streets, fires, earthquakes, two hurricane, major hurricanes back to back, uh, supposed to be a space rock heading this way around election day. Um, and, and there's no repentance. The church has little repentance. The nation has little repentance. And the nation is filled with sin and wickedness. And we're upset because we have to wear a mask or we got to stand six feet apart in the grocery store. The devil has taken our focus off of what's really wrong. This pandemic is a distraction. Yeah, it's a sign of the Lord's return, but the enemy is using it as a distraction to where even the people of God are getting their eyes off of what's really wrong with America. America is sin sick and the nation is spiritually broken and needs to be restored. The walls of protection have been broken down because of sin the gates, the gates are burned with fire. The enemy, uh, I mean, look what's going on in the cities. That's, that's symbolic of what's going on in cities right now. They're burning, burning uh, businesses and police departments even. Uh, shame on us. We need to grow up. We, we need to not be upset because we have to wear a mask or stand six feet, of, feet apart. We need to uh, take care of spiritual business. What's really wrong with America? It's not... COVID is a, a little thing compared to what's really wrong with America. Yes, rejoice, because many of these difficulties are signs of the Lord's return. We need to get excited. We know that Jesus is coming back. We know that this is opportunity for us to witness to people. But don't neglect the business of the healing of the land. Repent for yourself. Repent for our people. Repent for our nation. Ask the Lord to redeem America, deliver, free, heal, and restore our land. Bring the church in America to repentance, the lost in America to salvation. Uh, there, there's so much uh, that, that's going to happen here in the next couple of months. Uh, we, have, we have people running for office that love the Lord. Some are brand new Christians. They're, they're trying to introduce the nation to Jesus. And we have others that absolutely detest the church and, and Christianity because the Christianity doesn't go along with their immoral, liberal, sinful uh, uh, agenda and, and their, their campaign program and so on. We want to, we want to look at how, did, how does America get in this condition? And I think one of the greatest, one of the one of the greatest tools, strongest tools of the enemy, is this gradual assimilation. The devil introduces a little bit of sin, little by little, little by little, and the people, even the people of God, are overcome with spiritual apathy, and pretty soon this sin has overtaken the land. We, I shared last week, there are things going on in America today that have been legalized that are so immoral that 40, 50 years ago, you, you wouldn't even talk about it. Let's, let's talk about the, 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 um, the, the gay movement and all kinds of sexual immorality. Adults wouldn't even discuss these things. You can go to uh, any, any third grader in school and start asking them about gay marriage and they can tell you all about it. When I was a kid, kids didn't know about this stuff. They didn't, it wasn't something that parents would even talk about. It, it's, it's something that is so ungodly, we shouldn't even mention. But like a frog in the frying pan, remember that old story about you put the frog in the frying pan and you, you turn it on real low and then you gradually increase the heat and, uh, and before you know it, he's overcome and dead and, and, and didn't even have the sense to jump out of the frying pan because it was a gradual assimilation. And this is what's happened 
in America, the sin, the fires of sin have been cranked up slowly, and now it's at a level to where it's Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the church, the church gradually adjusts to the morals of the world. That's what's happened in America. Uh, the church has assimilated and, grad and gradually uh, accepted some of these things. Uh, a couple more possibly. Hopeless resignation. Another thing that happens with the people of God, they see the sin increasing in the nation and they just throw up their hands and offer no resistance. Say, well, well there's nothing I can do about it. I give up. I surrender. Uh, and that's happened a lot in America. Many Christians have just gone along with, that, with whatever uh, the sinners say and whatever the government says because the government uh, has legalized a lot of things that are absolute abominations to God. Then there's the, the, the frantic humanism. Even the church has gotten wrapped up in this. Whenever there's trouble in cities, trouble with certain uh, ethnic groups, uh, trouble with, with young people or older people, whatever, uh, they immediately think if, if, we can do, if we can bring social justice, that's gonna fix everything. Let's give them more money, Let's, let's put social workers all around them to advise them. That's not going to take care of sin. The sin problem can only be solved by the blood of Jesus. Preaching of the gospel of Christ to those that are sinning is the only thing that's ever going to fix their life, the only thing that's ever going to bring eternal life. Uh, uh, all this socialism, oh, it, it makes, makes a lot of noise and gets a lot of attention and gets a lot of press, but it doesn't solve the problem. The, the, the biggest problem in, in America today is the sin problem. It's not, it's not a political party. It's not any kind of uh, 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 racial thing. It's not any kind of a social thing. The biggest problem in America today is the sin problem. And then the, the correct spiritual response, what the church should be doing. Okay. We can't say, well, it's too late, we blew it, we let the nation get into this condition, because then we're resigning, we're surrendering. We've got to get a hold of the Lord, and we've got to repent for the church. Lord, forgive the church. Forgive the church for going along with the world. Forgive the church for going along with the courts. And Lord, forgive our land. There are people sinning, there are people in, involved in all kinds of immorality, and they don't even realize how serious this is. They don't realize it's an abomination to you. And so like, like Nehemiah, he got down on his knees. He cried out to God. He got this report on Judah and Jerusalem. His appeal was to God, who's above all the nations. He is king of kings, ruler over all the nations. He's the one that we have to go to to fix our nation. The nation is not going to get fixed in Washington or Sacramento or even in the courthouse here in the county. Uh, the nation's going to get fixed when God's people appeal to the king of kings, the ruler of all nations. And so Nehemiah fasted and prayed, and then he obeyed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Nehemiah continually cries out to God, and he appeals even at the risk of death to lead the spiritual renewal for, for Israel, for Judah, and for Jerusalem. At the risk of death, Nehemiah was the cupbearer before the king. And the cupbearer before the king was a very trusted, this man uh, made sure that no poison was put in the king's cup. He was highly trusted and he was supposed to be an encourager. So Nehemiah goes before the king and is, he's all distraught. And even showing emotion in the presence of the king could be a death sentence because he's supposed to be like an encourager, um, a jolly guy, and make sure the king is encouraged all the time. But he let his emotions go. And he went before the king, and the king loved him and said, what's wrong? Why are, why are you in this condition? We'll get into that uh, another time. So this, the, greatest, the greatest nationwide revival took place because Nehemiah got down on his knees, fasted, prayed, cried out to God for his nation, and began to lead this nationwide revival. And so the Lord was with him. Nehemiah knew that only God could slow the tide 
and reduce, reduce the decay of his nation. Only God could give mercy and forgive and return his glory to the land. Only God can heal America. As you look at America today, what do you think? Is it time, what is it time to do? Is it time to uh, give up, time to surrender, time to go along with the crowd, or is it time to cry out to the God of all creation, the King of kings, the ruler of all nations? Let's pray. Father, forgive us, cleanse us, heal our land, the walls are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. Help us. Like Nehemiah, we turn to the only one, the only one who can bring revival, the only one that can bring spiritual awakening in the land. Create in us a humble and contrite heart that will respond with fasting and prayer and repentance and obedience. Oh, Lord, that we not only would repent of the sin in our land, but then turn and obey your word. Lord, I pray, lead us and show us your way as we look at this life of Nehemiah. It's, it's, it's almost a carbon copy of the condition of America today. We need this. We need this teaching. We need this action today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I, I pray that you're taking notes and you'll get into the scripture and check it out go to nehemiah chapter one read it for yourself take a look at america take a look at israel at that day or judah and jerusalem and then look at america today and see what the answer is we have to go to our god the only one who can reverse the course of a nation god bless you stay in prayer